Today I'm just going to have a look at the terminology for the different parts of the watch. Judging by some of the questions on the reviews, there are a few people who might find that useful. So starting off with the Seiko, we've got the crown or winder. Um, obviously on an automatic watch, you can sometimes wind the watch up with that. On this particular Seiko, um, it doesn't have hand winding, and so you can't, there's, there's no, no, at no point can you wind it. This does have a screw down crown, it's a dive watch, 200 meters water resistant, and at the moment it's screwed down. If we unscrew it, get it out to a point where it just spins and does nothing. You then pull it out to what most people would call the first click, and that's where you can adjust the date. And then the next click is where you adjust the time. You need to be a little bit careful pulling the crown out. My watchmaker says that one of the most common problems he finds is people have just pulled the crown out so hard that they've pulled the crown and the stem right out of the watch, which is a bit of a nuisance and can be cost you a few hundred dollars to repair. So that's the crown screwed back down again. On some watches like this one, you've got crown guards, which stop the crown getting knocked. Other watches, like this dress Seiko here, there's no crown guard at all. The crown's just straight on the side of the case, and um, there's uh, no crown guards at all. So that's crown guards. The other button or um, bits and pieces you'll find on the side of the watch are pushes, usually found on a chronograph or something similar. This is a uh, echo drive with a mechanical chronograph mechanism, and so it's got pusher there, a pusher there, and the crown here. So, mechanical chronograph, so it's quite a firm push and you can hear the click. That starts it off. Another click. And then, this is a flyback chronograph, so if you watch the um, second hand, it'll fly back with this pusher here. Obviously on digital watches, they access all of the digital functions. And on some of the other watches, you'll find that they access other features like on this echo drive here it looks as if at first glance it's just got the crown with a slightly flared crown guard but in fact if we have a closer look you'll see that there are tiny little pushes which you can just access with the end of a biro pen or a toothpick those are for setting the perpetual calendar this has got a perpetual calendar and that's how you tell the watch that uh, what, what the time, what the date and the leap year is. The um, next thing is the glass or the crystal. That's obviously the what covers the watch. You get three main types. Most watches these days have a mineral crystal. If you go slightly more up market, you'll find a sapphire crystal, which is synthetic sapphire. It's quite a bit harder. It's slightly easier to shatter. Mineral crystals are often found in either cheaper watches or dive watches. And the last one is a plastic or acrylic crystal. You'll find that on cheaper watches and also on quite a lot of the older watches. Some of the um, older Rolexes have an acrylic crystal. Some people really like the look. And one big advantage is that you can polish any um, scratches out with a simple polishing compound. Okay, move on to the bezel. That's this bit here, which is around the edge of the um, case. And on a dive watch, you can move the bezel. That's designed to keep track of how long you've been underwater. This one moves around anti-clockwise. You can't move it. It's unidirectional, so you can't move it clockwise. It's a safety feature so that you uh, can never stay down too long. There are quite a few watches that don't really have a bezel or certainly don't have one with any markings on. The Dress Seco here. There's very little bezel at all. One thing to watch out if you're buying a dive watch and you actually want a movable bezel is with some of the cheaper watches, it can look like a movable bezel, but it doesn't actually move at all. This Astina here, which is not a dive watch but is styled like one, looks as if it might have a bezel that moves, but in fact it's fixed. If you look, you'll see that it's part of the case. Next we move on to lugs which seems to confuse a few people. That's just the name for the part of the um, case which slopes down 
and you attach the strap on. Um, and the lug width is the distance between the two lugs, so between my two fingers here. Um, you obviously need to know the lug width to get a replacement strap. You often find on a leather strap, like this one here, that it's printed. So you can see that there, that's a 20mm strap on metal bracelets and um, some of the rubber ones there's often nothing printed so you do have to measure it. The other thing you'll often hear people talk about is the lug to lug measurement and that's between the two ends of the lugs and that's important because that's the part that actually sits on your wrist and so depending on the width of your wrist the watch will either feel too big or too small or just about right. You'll usually find that those measurements are between 40 and 50 millimeters on most modern watches. Okay, moving over to the back of the watch, you've got the case back. This has got a screw down case back. There's a dive watch. You um, take it off with a special tool which um, fits in these little slots here. There are other watches which just have press on case backs and some mechanical watches, usually dress watches but occasionally dive watches, have a see-through case back like the Seiko 5 here where you can see the mechanism through a mineral crystal or sapphire crystal at the back. With straps and bracelets most people refer to a leather or a rubber strap as a strap. If it's a metal strap people generally call it a bracelet. Some people call them bands, um, whatever it's as long as you know what you're talking about um, and the material, um, it doesn't really make a lot of difference. There are different types of buckles. These watches here have what's called a tang buckle. So that's a standard buckle like you find on any uh, most belts with um, a buckle and a tang. The other common sorts are a deployment clasp, often found on dress watches. This one here clicks together like so. No, it doesn't. It clicks together like that. And the main advantage of these is that it saves wear and tear on your leather strap and it can make the leather strap both more comfortable to wear and last a lot, lot longer. They come in a variety of different styles. This one here is slightly different. And clicks through there. On a dive watch or a slightly um, more upmarket watch you'll sometimes find that they've got a locking clasp so this one's got a safety clasp that clips over there and then two buttons on either side which you have to push in to undo the clasp so it clicks down and then there's a safety clasp over the top Notice this one's got micro adjustment holes, which uh, is useful, makes it much easier to size the bracelet to fit. The other thing of note is the quality of the clasp um, and, and the link. This is a cast um, titanium clasp, which uh, just looks nice and it's um, quite a lot stronger. If you look on a cheaper watch, you'll find like this Invicta here which is again titanium but you'll see that this one's just stamped out of a thin piece of titanium it doesn't feel as nice and it's much more likely to get um, broken or snapped okay on some watches you'll find a chapter ring if you look on the inside of this watch you'll see that there's a small just on the inside of the dial there's a small insert which is called the chapter ring which has got fractions of a minute marked on it. Um, not all watches have one but that's what people are talking about when they talk about a chapter ring. Date windows, obviously where the date is, sometimes there's a date window, sometimes there's a day and date. Um, there are umpteen different names for different shapes of hands. Um, I'll just show you a couple of examples. The Seiko dive watch here has got stick hands. The Invicta has got what's called 
a Mercedes hour hand and that's classically found on Rolex watches and quite a few others and lots of the lots of the dress watches have dagger hands like this Seiko here which um, give you a very sharp nice look there are lots of others but those are three different sorts and finally you'll hear lots of people get very enthusiastic about the loom, loom on watches and that's just quite literally the luminescent material on the dials. Seiko's are well known for having particularly good loom so if I just charge up the dive watch here 1001, 1002, 1003, 1005 and then these next two we should see the difference in the luminosity of the hands. You'll notice that the watch in the middle has got a completely luminous dial. So although the hands do glow slightly, the dial actually glows. And it may not be particularly obvious here, but you'll find that after five minutes or so, the Seiko will still be glowing, whereas the Invicta will have stopped. The Seiko in the middle with the luminous dial, that'll keep glowing for two or three hours. That's quite an old watch. Um, they may well glow longer. So hope that's been useful. If you find it useful, please like the video or subscribe to the channel. Cheers.